Hey, everybody. Happy Monday. Uh, super excited for this chat today about trends and market opportunities and channels in the cybersecurity space. A great topic, great guest from Barracuda Networks. Jason, how are you? I'm really good. I'm really good. Like you said, it's a great start of the week. Look, every day is great in the OC in California where, where you are. We were just talking about uh, some good times in Anaheim and Disneyland. But on a different note, maybe introduce yourself, uh, your role at Barracuda. And um, who is Barracuda Networks these days? Many of us know of the brand, the name, the company, but haven't caught up in a while. So I'll, I'll start with uh, Barracuda. So, in fact, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. So it's 20 years wow. of- uh, 20 years of uh, developing incredible technology, innovating and um, staying at the forefront um, of technology, cybersecurity, data protection, 20 years of channel integrity, uh, 20 years of partnering, mm. um, a company based up in Campbell, California. Um, we have a true security platform from email protection, web protection, application security, network security. Um, then all kind of wrapped around um, XDR capability with the 24-7 global SOC and all the process and technology that you need to run um, an XDR solution. Uh, so the company's doing great. Uh, I've been here about 15 months now. I've found it just an incredible company culture, just really good people, um, good teamwork, right? Everyone just works together. Uh, and then specifically to me, I run our global channels or I'm a VP of our partner ecosystem. So we have um, many different types of partners from our large global distributors to our specialized distributors to our managed service providers, VARs, SIs, right? All the different types of partner business models that are out there in our industry today are under my uh, domain of responsibility. That includes channel strategy. Uh, partner programs, partner experience, partner enablement, and then really working with our teams all around the world, you know, right down to drive that field co-selling uh, between our sales teams inside, outside, and the renewals teams and our partner sales teams to go out and win business together and and uh, help uh, secure uh, the people, the applications, and the data of our mutual customers. Fantastic. I'm getting the sense you're all about the channel, but we'll come back to that uh, uh, and how the channel is changing, evolving over time. But let, let's let's set the scene here. How does Barracuda Networks fit you know, on the cybersecurity landscape, given the role of data protection compliance, you know, top of mind to everyone in the C-suite these days? Um, where's your sweet spot in, in this very busy and compl- complex cyber landscape? Yeah, so we, um, you know, a true platform, right? So there's always a, um, you know, new entrance into our space that typically might have kind of a point product. We've been innovating a platform for 20 years and, you know, have a a platform that delivers security efficacy, usability, manageability for our for our partners so that we can stop threats in this kind of ever increasing and widening threat landscape that the bad guys are are going after. We. are built, our SaaS offerings are built on the public cloud. We have incredible partnerships mm. with Microsoft and AWS. So our, our solutions can scale up. We have tons and tons of huge enterprise customers. But sweet spot, we would say, is you know, 2,000 users and below, where mm. unfortunately, you know, um, hacking and cyber crime has become democratized in the last half a decade. You know, as you know, the the bad guys no longer discriminate. They'll go after a 10 user organization, a 50 user organization, anywhere that they can get in and get data or credentials or just launch um, even low dollar ransomware attacks. So we specialize in the 2000 and below strong vertical market focus, retail, banking Mm. and finance, hospitality, and then of course the public sector. Yeah, it's a great uh, overview. And let's talk about distribution and channels in this cloud-enabled world. Its cloud has sort of changed everything in the traditional go-to-market for everyone. Um, you know, how should you stay ahead? Uh, how can your partners stay ahead in a cloud-driven world, in a world where traditional two-tier kind of distribution is under pressure? Um, you know, what, what's the value proposition these days when it comes to the channel and cloud? Mm-hmm. So I, I, like you mentioned earlier, sound like a channel guy through and through, and I have. I've been (laughs) blessed and lucky and fortunate in my career to have been working in channel roles for over two decades. 
So I'm a huge proponent of the model. I still firmly believe in that role of the local trusted advisor, right? I still mm-hmm. believe that there's a difference between the technology and its successful implementation and, you know, or customer lifecycle management. And I, I think that a partners, whether it's a, a small local partner, a, a larger regional or national partner, or regardless of business model, pure services, retail and services, managed services, end users, they need help, public mm. sector and private sector. They need help putting the pieces together, making it all work, right? Particularly now in the era of, of um, kind of cyber defense, where you have more and more tools in an end customer environment, spinning off more and more alerts, right? Some that are the right alerts and others that are false alerts. They just need help. So, um, you know, the, whether the technology is delivered from the cloud or delivered on-prem, again, I, I just believe that end customers need uh, need help from, from channel partners. And then you know, more broadly around the question on distribution, right, there too, and, I, and I've said it for a while, this term distribution is, I think it's different in our industry mm-hmm. and the technology than in many other industries, right? You, you might work, look at the lumber industry or the furniture, in, furniture industry, and maybe distribution truly is warehousing and conveyance and pick, pack, and ship. In our industry, I, I think I, I rather use the terms aggregation and channel services. I mean, the distributors these days are aggregators of technology, again, whether delivered through the cloud or hardware or software. And they are, they're, they're channel services companies. They offer mm. such a wide array of services for both the vendors and the partner channels and even some end customers that that's how we need to think about them these days. So I, I think distribution has an incredible role to play. I was recently at um, the AWS reInvent show in November. And you know, AWS, you know, multiple meetings, they proactively bring up their partnerships domestically with Ingram Micro and TD Cynix and everything that mm. TD Cynix and Ingram doing from both an aggregation of their kind of public cloud compute as well as channel development, you know, recruitment of new partners for AWS and then the enablement and growth of those partners. So distributions kept evolving. Again, I think about it as more of this wide array of channel development services and kind of aggregation. And that's why I, I I don't, uh, I'm not one of these that's that's ever believed in kind of the death and disintermediation of distribution. I mean, they keep reinventing themselves and adding a ton of value for the channel. Indeed. Yeah. And it's, it's fascinating to observe these cloud marketplaces like the one at Amazon. Um, How how does the channel interact with uh, the marketplace at Amazon in your case specifically? And what impact has it have on the whole, Mm -hmm. your whole go to market? So it's interesting that you know we talk a lot with our partners globally around marketplaces, and whether it's the um, AWS marketplace, uh, Microsoft's Azure marketplace, and the new mechanisms or those new vehicles to help their end customers procure not just the public cloud technologies themselves, but third-party technology. Those are the the CPPO, the consulting partner private offer with AWS, and then the MPO with Microsoft, which is the kind of marketplace private offer. And when we talked to our partners, in fact, I had a discussion a week and a half ago with our America's Partner Advisory Board um, in Dallas. And it's interesting, Evan, that you still have a wide array of partner, you know, as far as kind of maturity around marketplaces. Some partners are, you'll ask, and they're, they're not doing much. They don't know much about it. They don't really know how to do a CPPO. Maybe aren't signed up with AWS. Don't know what an AWS EDP or enterprise data plan is and how that creates opportunities for them to capture more. Some partners are not just dipping the toe in the water, maybe doing a bit. They, they know how to ask the right questions to end users, get out ahead of when an end user might want to procure through marketplace, they might have know how to go after some of that, what they call at risk spend on an EDP, um, but still need a lot of help, a lot of enablement, need to know more about all these programs and a lot of the, the, uh, the money, quite frankly, that's available through the public cloud providers to drive marketplace business. And then you have other partners that are 
doing a lot. You know, I have one of our PAB members, I'll, they'll go unnamed, but uh, one of the PAB members had said they, they've done 30 of the CPPOs uh, in less than the last 12 months. So there's, it, it's interesting. So partners are aware, but they're certainly at different phases of maturity as far as their engagement with the uh, AWS and Azure and Google marketplaces. That's a great insight. And speaking of marketplaces, you're also active with Microsoft. And of course, the Azure ecosystem is huge. How would you see them as different or differentiated from or uh, any, any anything unique about that ecosystem that you found versus the others you were operating? So Microsoft, I, I always say like Microsoft did the industry a tremendous favor a decade ago. And <laughs> when a lot of us were talking about SaaS and cloud computing and you know there wasn't really a bit of a bit of a universal acceptance of what is cloud and is it a threat for the channel or is it an opportunity for the remember all those debates that we had about a decade ago and some partners weren't being incredibly proactive right about building out their competencies capabilities and, and businesses around cloud i always say microsoft did the industry a favor because they dragged the channel, sometimes kicking and screaming, into the cloud when they made notable changes, right, with BPAWS and then became Office 365 and licensing, mm. comp compensation, and, um, you know, how they would profile their partners, even their own KPIs and their own team bonuses. So partners were, you know, kind of forced, right, into the cloud, first with uh, O365 and then with Azure. And that they, they started putting a lot of attention there. So I think that did the industry a big favor because now those partners like were kind of forced to do it, to talk to their end customers about it and to build out the right skill set and services capabilities around cloud. And then that benefited other vendors in the industry and, and a new ecosystem of the of cloud providers and ISVs and DevOps. I think now Microsoft is going to do the industry a similar favor as it relates to those partners who haven't yet built out strong security competencies. Microsoft has a big focus on, on security. They work with ISVs like a Barracuda from a build, host, a go-to-market perspective. They also have their own uh, incredible technologies. And I think that for some of those partners who Maybe they dabbled with some of the legacy technologies of Symantec or a McAfee in the days. Those partners, I think Microsoft's going to really build out their security awareness, capabilities, focus, and then make just more partners have more uh, skill set to help end customers. That, too, will help third party, you know, additional and complementary vendors like a Barracuda as you have more and more partners that Microsoft have pulled into cybersecurity. Fantastic. Well, it's really interesting to see that evolve. Uh, you, you also talk about something called partner empathy in the context of security solutions. I saw that on a blog. That's more than just Jason's a nice guy to do business with, I assume, right? There's there's a philosophy of some, some kind behind that? Yeah, I mean, there too... I, every, I always say everything that I've ever learned in the industry is just listening and talking to partners, right? Mm. And I remember there was a group of partners and they were sitting around talking about kind of the average vendor who knocks on their door and calls them up and says, hey, you know, you, you'd be so lucky to learn about my technology. You've got to take us into your end customers. Here's our typical deck and what that mm. typical deck looked like. And it starts with, how much money they raise and more, what mm. their stock price is and this and that. <laughs> and they were, those partners were, were joking around a little bit about that. And I, it, it got me thinking a lot. And I said, you know, in our industry, there is a lot of what I'll call vendor myopia, right? Where the vendors mm. are just seeing the world through their own four walls, their technology, their investors, their bonuses, instead of putting themselves in their partner shoes and having an inside out perspective. So partner empathy, again, a company like Barracuda, 20 years of channel loyalty. We haven't oscillated mm. or evaporated between <laughs> indirect and direct. 20 years of figuring out partnering, which is an art and a science. Putting ourselves in our partnerships, understanding their brand, the solutions that they take to market, their services, 
their KPIs and bonus metrics and how their sales teams get paid, right? If you can understand that, then you can truly create the proverbial win-win between the vendor and the partner, right? That's what partner empathy is. I I call it, it, it's interesting. I have this like uh, formula for success and I call it IQ plus EQ plus AQ equals SQ. Now bear with me. I know that's a lot of Qs, right? So (laughs) I can't do math on a Monday. So I'm really challenged here. Exactly. So (laughs) for a channel manager, somebody working with partners, a vendor working with partners, you need to have an IQ, right? Smart, know the technology, Mm -hmm. do business planning, know your data. EQ, you need to have that emotional quotient or can you really partner, build relationships, have that partner empathy. AQ, are you using all the arrows in your quiver? all of the resources that are available to help those partners in grow their business. And if you do all those, you'll SQ, right? You'll smash your quota. So do you have the smarts? Do you have the heart? Do you have the darts? And if so, that's the art of partnering. So I just, that's, that's partner empathy. Let's put ourselves in the partner's shoes. They're on the front lines every day with our prospects and our mutual customers. And how do you really kind of not, not look at the world with, this vendor biopia, but truly put yourselves in the shoes of your partners and customize your product, your programs, the manageability, your budgets, all that stuff to drive a a, successful engagement with them. A wonderful insight. You also talk a lot lot about the concept of a partner multiplier effect. I know what a force multiplier is, but what does that mean, uh, you know, partner multiplier in cybersecurity? Yes. Yeah, so in fact, here too, we owe a little bit of a debt of gratitude to Microsoft. They had worked with IDC about two and a half years ago, and you know, took a look at um, you know the partners and selling Microsoft solutions, and then kind of the universe or the ecosystem that's around uh, when a partner sells a Microsoft solution. And you know, it is true that. Partners aren't making a ton of margin just on resale of a Microsoft license. So Mm -hmm. Microsoft was trying to articulate through the research, like you might not make a ton of money on just the margin resale, but here's all the other ways that you can monetize your franchise with Microsoft, with pre-sale services, post-sale services, managed services, third-party complementary services, like support, lifecycle management, all those sorts of things. And at that time, Microsoft had said, hey, we think the dollar of Microsoft license uh, sold represents about nine. It was either 9.51 or 9.15 of partner ecosystem economic opportunity. That's the fancy term or the 9x of partner multiplier. And then in the last couple of years, some other vendors have, have you know, a Salesforce and AWS, Google have started to articulate their multiplier to the channel. We've done some research in the last year and found that our best-in-class partners have about a 5.5x multiplier on the dollar of Barracuda sold. We just are publishing a case study of a partner in the Ben and uh, Lux region that's getting about an 8x multiplier. So, mm. yep, we, we provide really healthy uh, margins to our partners. We love when our partners make strong margins. But we also think from, again, both a pre-sale, post-sale, and customer lifecycle management there's a lot more opportunities for partners. So do we have the right programs? Do we have the right enablement? Can we put our partners in a position to capture all of that multiplier? So sell the dollar of Barracuda, but but go get that five and a half dollars that you can get all around it. Excellent. Um, So looking at your website here, you have a ton of content around educating the channel and equipping, enabling them with the right sort of content. Um, and, and that's that's needed, right, to react to these industry trends. What what are the challenges in the in the market that are really driving your adoption? Uh, obviously, email protection is a huge challenge these days. Email security, ransomware. I see you have a, a managed XDR uh, service. Uh, what else is really driving sales for those channels? Yeah, so I, I would say that, you know, I always say, like, again, a little bit of partner empathy. I, Our partners are, they're on the front lines. They're, mm-hmm. they're managing all the demands of the good guys, meaning, like, <laughs> their employees, their customers, and their vendor relationships. Then they're having to stave off all the bad guys in this ever-increasing, <laughs> you know, attack surface. Um, 
they're juggling ah, typically about a dozen different vendor relationships and three to four distributor relationships. It's getting harder and harder for them to find and retain talent out there, right? Especially specialized, truly specialized cybersecurity mm. talent. So it's difficult. So I always start with like, got to make it easy for partners. Enablement mm. needs to be easy. It can't be a barrier to entry. Your certification programs can't be onerous. We've got to really make it easy. Give them the right tools. Uh, and then like we talked to our PAB last week and we said, hey, what's how do you want your training? How do you want this enablement? We can do live classes. We can do live remote. We can do on demand. And mm. it, the answer was all of the above. In some cases, they want to push their engineers out, stick them into a classroom for a week and just make sure they complete everything. In other cases, they want classroom environment, but remote. And others, they say, hey, I, we just want it available on demand, right? So it's kind of self-service. So it's hard to be a partner. You've got to make it easy for them, right? you got to give it to them, uh, the content, the tools, in the way that they want to consume it. And then you have to iterate, iterate, iterate that curriculum because our industry moves so quickly. I mean, particularly cyber defense, cyber security, there's something new every week. And how do they build efficacy into their business? How do they manage with their end clients? How do they sift off a lot of the noise? This topic of AI has popped up, right? Quickly, like quickly has popped up. And now it's good AI versus bad AI. Do mm. Have we done enough as an industry to help our partners to understand the ramifications? You know, what is bad AI? How are the bad guys using it? What is the impact of all that technology, all those tools that we've already sold to our mutual customers? What are, what's good AI? How can AI help us? How can they work with the Barracuda SOC with our XDR to sift through the sand to truly find the threats versus the noise, right? So it's a, it's a lot. You got to iterate. You got to keep above, you know, help them stay on the cutting edge so that they can be those trusted advisors. But you got to do it while appreciating that they're all busy. Speaking of busy, uh, I'm sure you have a busy agenda the next 90 days. You share to maybe care to share a peek into what's coming up, what you're excited about, any travel events or otherwise with you and the team. Absolutely. So I'm, uh, I head off to Europe on Saturday. I'll be I'll be Saturday through Saturday in the UK, France, uh, Netherlands, and Belgium. And um, this is the end of our fiscal year, February. So mm. we'll have a strong finish to um, Q4. And then we'll start our fiscal in March. So, you know, that means that you're closing. And that means you're also doing all the planning. You're building your, your strategy plans. You're, you know, rolling it out. We just hosted a workshop in Atlanta just to make sure that we're all on the same page as we go into next year. We're looking forward to our SKO, which is in the second week of um, of uh, March, um, you know, then we have an awesome president's club. So at the SKO, we'll announce the winners and those who get to go to our president's club this year. So I'm kind of constantly on the road. Uh, I like traveling. Uh, I love engaging with our teams. I love engaging with our partners and distributors. So I'll travel. We'll close the year strong and then we'll, uh, you know, have us have a really good start to our, our FY25 on the 1st of March. Wow, sounds fun! Congratulations on a strong finish, as they say, and um, great chatting. I, I learned a lot. I haven't talked channel uh, insider with channel insiders in a while. A lot has changed. A lot has remained the same. And uh, mm -hmm. congratulations on all the success. Thank you. I, re I, I really do appreciate it. I, and you see, I love talking shop about the channel. It gets me excited. I'm passionate about it. Anytime you want to do any follow ups or uh, talk channel a little bit more, I'm always here to help. And uh, yeah, again, thank you for the opportunity today, Evan. Yeah, likewise. And everyone watching on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, you know, reach out to Jason and, and Barracuda Networks uh, as a collaborator or uh, otherwise. So take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.